Good day, Grade 12, and welcome to our virtual tourism classroom. My name is Penny Forsler. I'm a tourism teacher in the Nelson Mandela Bay District, and I'm be presenting today's lesson on sustainable tourism. Before I start, let me acknowledge the role played by Erica Ferreira, who is the subject advisor for tourism in the Nelson Mandela Bay District for Zone 1. Erica has compiled this magnificent PowerPoint that today's lesson is based on. And I would also like to extend our thanks to the e-teaching and learning directorate of the Eastern Cape Department of Education. They have made these lessons possible. As you see, grade 12 on your screen at the moment is our topic for today's lesson, sustainable tourism. And we will be focusing specifically on the three pillars of sustainable tourism. Let us take a look at your curriculum. You will see the three pillars of sustainable tourism, which refer specifically to people, planet and profit. The first bullet that we will be concerning ourselves with today is the concept as well as I will be giving you some background on the triple bottom line approach. Secondly, we will be taking, look, uh, taking a look at the three pillars, the environmental pillar, otherwise known as planet, the economic pillar, otherwise known as profit, and the social pillar, otherwise known as people. And under each of those pillars, we will be looking at a variety of information that goes with each one of those. We will start with revision of Grade 10 concepts. And we start with sustainability, the term sustainability. Sustainability means meeting our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. It's quite self-explanatory, Grade 12, but let us just read it through once more slowly. Meeting our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So you should recognize the word sustainable in there, which I'm sure you've heard before. The next concept that we are revising from Grade 10 is that of sustainable tourism. You have a lovely definition up on your screen at the moment. Tourism that takes full account of its current and future economic, social and environmental impacts addressing the needs of visitors, the industry, the environment, and host communities. Now, I just want to take a few minutes to unpack that. Tourism that takes full account of its current and future impacts. So, sustainable tourism takes into account the impact that it is presently having as well as what it could possibly have in the future specifically with regard to its economic impact its social impact and its environmental impact and at the same time is addressing the needs of visitors also addressing the needs of the industry addressing needs of the environment as well as host communities. Now you will also remember in grade 10 you learnt about a carbon footprint. A carbon footprint is the total amount of greenhouse gas emissions that a person, organization, event or product has produced in a given time frame. Greenhouse gases of which 
CO2, which is carbon dioxide, is an example, contribute to global warming and climate change. Now, if you go back to your grade 10 tourism, you will remember that you learnt about this carbon footprint. You add a definition, and that definition is what is up on the screen at the moment. It's all about the greenhouse gas emissions, the carbon dioxide, that a person, organization, event or product produces, which then has an influence on the earth around us. And that influence contributes to global warming and to climate change. Okay, now we will take a look at our metric work, the three pillars of sustainable tourism, people, planet and profit. And those are all interlinked with each other and at the end of the day ensure sustainability. For a start, we will look at the concept and background of the triple bottom line approach. The triple bottom line refers to the three, that's where the word triple comes in. So it refers to the three measures of business performance. So the first measure of business performance is the economic measure, which we refer to as profit. The second is environmental, which we refer to as planet. And the third is social, which we refer to as people. So if you look at your screen, you will see on the bottom the three pillars, people, planet and profit, hence the name triple bottom line approach, because triple refers to the fact that there are three measures that are to be considered, the people, the planet as well as the profit. Now some information about the background of the triple bottom line approach. The traditional way to measure a business's performance is to look at its profitability. Now if one takes a look at a financial statement you will see that the profit that was generated appears at the end of the financial statement, which is why profit is often referred to as the bottom line, hence bottom line approach. Now we have a triple bottom line approach, which is now not only profit anymore, but it is far wider than that. The triple bottom line concept came into use when world leaders realized that economic development which had negative environmental and social effects was not sustainable and that we needed to measure all the effects of development. Therefore, a company's performance not only depends on how much money it is making, in other words, the mar margin of profit that the company is generating, and it doesn't only depend on considerations such as job creation, but also on the effect that that company or business has on the social and the natural environment. Now, I just want to spend a little bit of time unpacking this with you, Grade 12. You will see that in the past, um, the focus was on economic development and that economic development had negative effects both on the environment and social effects and that type of economic development was therefore not regarded as sustainable and therefore all of the effects of development had to be taken into account and that is why when measuring a company's performance we don't only look at how much money 
the company is making or other economic considerations, we also need to take a serious look at the effect that that company or business has on the social environment as well as on the natural environment. So there you have your three pillars that are called the three pillars of sustainable tourism. Just a little bit more history and background here. King 3. Now King 3 is the code that regulates corporative governance in South Africa. King 3 requires companies to report on their performance in terms of three aspects. And yes, you were right. Those are economic, environmental and social. So when any company or business in South Africa has to report on their performance, they will not only do it in terms of the economic pillar, but also in terms of the environmental and social pillars. We will start by looking at the environmental pillar. And what we are focusing on here, grade 12, is good environmental practices because these are vital for a successful tourism business to protect the natural environment. So we have a tourism business that needs to protect the natural environment and that is done through good environmental practices. And we will be taking a look at a variety of these environmental practices, starting with resource management. Now you'll see as we go through the rest of the PowerPoint each a slide refers to a specific enviro uh, environmental practice and it has also been illustrated with some lovely images so that it makes it easier to study the content of sustainable tourism. So when looking at resource management, the first aspect that we are focusing on is that of energy and how do we conserve energy? Firstly, by installing energy saving light bulbs in buildings. We can also install renewable energy sources, solar panels. We should be encouraging guests to switch off lights and also any electric um, apparatus that they are perhaps using when they are in their rooms. They must switch them off when they leave. And another way of conserving energy is to turn down the temperature of the geyser. In that way the geyser will not have to use such a huge amount of energy to warm all of the water. So there on your screen red 12 you have four strategies that assist any tourism business in managing the energy usage so that it is limited and that that business can then be sustainable. The next resource management that we will be taking a look at is um, management of water. Again, some lovely images on the screen to help you to study this work. Firstly, find and repair all leaks. Convert to water efficient flush toilets. Encourage guests to shower instead of taking a bath. Encourage guests to reuse towels instead of washing and replacing them daily. And each and every one of these strategies that you see on the screen in front of you will assist in saving water. Therefore, assist in resource management. Then we take a look at waste management, which is the three R's, and you see them on your screen on the left-hand side. Reuse, reduce, 
and recycle. On the right hand side of your screen you will see that each of those is unpacked and we are given ways in which we should be reducing, reusing and recycling. If we reduce that means we must lessen, make less the amount of resources that we use. So if we are to reduce we must use less, buy less and avoid waste. So instead of printing documents on paper we should rather use read them electronically. If we buy supplies in large quantities it will assist in reducing the amount of packaging that is used. If we use tap water instead of bottled water we will reduce the amount of plastic that we use and obviously by taking shorter showers we are going to reduce the amount of water that we use. By reusing we mean use an item more than once. So instead of buying a plastic bag each and every time you go to a shop, rather you reuse those plastic bags. Instead of uh, getting a new container each and every time you buy milk or water, use refillable containers. And then we get to recycling. Recycling involves separating waste materials so that those recycle recyclable products can be transformed into something new. Now many cities in the country have implemented separate bins for paper, glass and plastic because, because each of those materials can be recycled and it's also a very good idea to use your organic waste which is vegetable peels and fruit skins and egg shells. Those can be used to produce compost and that is a perfect example of recycling. Another good environmental practice is litter control. We should be uh, providing waste bins so that we can um, separate the different types of waste and I referred to that in the previous slide where we have separate bins for paper, glass, metal, plastic as you see on the left hand side of your screen and then do not litter. Guests and staff need to be informed of a no litter policy as we should be controlling the amount of litter that we generate. The following environmental practice is that of pollution control and there are various ways in which pollution can be controlled. Firstly you will see maintain vehicles to ensure fuel efficiency and reuse, uh, reduce pollution. Now a vehicle that is well maintained is going to be fuel efficient and not going to emit such a huge amount of exhaust gases into the atmosphere. The second aspect that we see on the screen is to encourage tourists to use public transport to reduce pollution. By using public transport that means that there are fewer vehicles on the road. So instead of each person traveling in their own vehicle by using public transport the amount of pollution is reduced. The following aspect is encourage tourists to use environmentally friendly transport. There you will see walking and riding on a bicycle. And finally use the shortest routes and only travel by car if necessary. By using the shortest route you will therefore decrease the amount of time that is spent on the road and therefore that correlates with a decrease in the amount of carbon emissions
from your vehicle. The following good environmental practice is that of environmentally friendly building. That refers to the way buildings are positioned, the way in which materials are used, it refers to space design, as well as technologies that are used to run the buildings. For an example, a solar panel. And all of these environmentally friendly building considerations can help to reduce the environmental impact that that business could perhaps, or that building could have on the environment. We have some very specific examples on the right hand side of your screen. Firstly, make use of natural building materials that have a low environmental impact. So instead of using steel to build the building, use wood. The second um, strategy that is given to you on the screen reads as follows. Insulation in walls, ceilings and floors will keep buildings cool in the hotter months and warm during the winter. So if you place insulation inside the walls, it will make ensure that the buildings don't get so very hot in the summer and keep that same building warm during the winter, which means that we will then not have to use heaters and air conditioners to heat and cool that room. Another consideration when looking at environmentally friendly building is effective window placement which can provide more natural light and lessen the need for electric lighting during the day. So a big strategically placed window that catches a lot of sunlight can save a lot of electricity because then it won't be necessary to switch the lights on during the day. The following that refers to good environmental practice is the promotion of indigenous flora and the control of alien invasive plants in grounds and gardens. Tourism businesses should conserve and plant indigenous species as they use less water. Now perhaps we should just spend a few seconds here to make sure we understand um, the term indigenous species and alien invasive species. An indigenous species is a plant species that is indigenous or endemic to a specific region. In other words, it that is where it or has always grown. An alien species or an alien invasive species is a plant species that comes from a different area. So a, a plant species that is indigenous to a specific area uses less water. The second bullet on your screen, alien invasive species should be removed if they threaten these indigenous species. And we also need to consider that alien invasive species use more water than indigenous species. So by controlling the alien invasive species in an area, we can ensure that we conserve water in that area. And another very serious consideration for tourism is that certain alien species can intensify the possibility of wildfires and that is not something that we want in our tourism industry. We're now going to take a look at the economic pillar, in other words the profit of the three pillars. Firstly here we start with the role of business and I'm reading from the screen tourism business are organizations which profit directly from tourism. There's just a definition so that we are all on the same page. Tourism businesses are organizations 
which profit directly from tourism. Now remember, we are busy with the economic pillar here, so it's all about profit. These businesses provide services and products which tourists need when visiting a destination. And through their economic activity, jobs are created and money is brought into a destination by tourists. Tourism businesses also spend money on the products and services that they need from other businesses. And so, therefore, tourism must create economic opportunities and benefits, not only for those tourism companies and their shareholders, but also for the local or host communities. So if I can take that slide that is in front of you at the moment and just summarize it in a nutshell. We have tourism businesses that provide certain services and products which tourists need. Those same tourists that are visiting that destination and making use of the services and products are bringing money into that tourism business and into that destination. At the same time, that particular tourism business that we are referring to also needs money because they have to obtain certain products and services from other businesses in order to render the service that they are supposed to render. So there you will see that tourism creates a variety of economic opportunities and benefits. Not only for the different tourism companies, but also for the local or the host communities. So it's a win-win situation at the end of the day as long as it is managed correctly. We take a look at the responsible attitude of a tourism business towards the people and the environment that it affects. If both a tourism business and the local community profit from that business and those who are affected by the business are involved and respect is given to them, this will lead to a to sustainable business development. Now that sounds great, 12, that sounds like a huge mouthful to understand. But let's unpack it and, and it will help for us to understand. Who do we have here? Who are we speaking about? We've got a tourism business and we've got the local community. So if both that tourism business on the one hand and the local community on the other hand profit from that business and at the same time those people who are affected by the business are involved with that business and they are respected that ensures that at the end of the day there is a sustainable business environment so a business environment that can be maintained that can be sustained so that just underlines the importance of a tourism business having a responsible attitude towards the people and the environment that it affects. There are various ways to manage economic impacts. If one looks at the two major bullets on your screen at the moment, you will see the first one is ownership and the second one is employment. If we take a look at ownership, remember we're busy with the economic pillar here. And ownership in that sense refers to community shareholding in the business. Promotion of local tourism ownership will increase the positive impact of tourism in an area. So you have ownership in the business that is shared by the community and that is an excellent way of managing an economic the economic impact another way is by employment practices and 
employment practices or fair em employment practice involves fair recruitment which with respect to gender, disability and race. Fair employment practices also refer to creation of decent work and paying a, a living wage. It also refers to protecting staff and communi uh, communities from exploitation. There could be exploitation of a sexual nature. Child labor is also exploitation. So um, the staff and the communities must be protected from that. And then we also have um, training and skills development. When a business uh, is practicing fair employment, they should be supporting staff in attending training courses so that the staff members can receive formal certificates, which means that they are gaining certain skills. And those skills will stand them in good stead in the future. On-the-job training is also part of employment. There you give people training in aspects of their job, not by sending them out to different courses, but while they are on the job, ensuring that they obtain the skills that they require. Then grade 12, we're going to take a look at ways to manage economic impacts and we have on our screens local procurement and broad-based black economic empowerment. Local procurement refers to buying locally manufactured products whereby a tourism business purchases the products that they need for their tourism business to operate, they purchase those products from local manufacturers instead of purchasing them from further afield. So that goes without saying that local suppliers should be used as far as possible because this results in a positive multiply effect and that positive multiply effect then means that money is spent and respent in that same area which prevents leakage economic leakage is the term that is used to refer to money that is generated in a specific community but then goes out of that community is spent outside of that community. So by having local procurement this prevents the leakage of money. If we take a look at broad-based black economic empowerment otherwise known as triple B double E this is a government policy which seeks to redress the economic exclusion and marginalization of black South Africans under apartheid. Now, Triple B Double E concerns aspects such as ownership, management, staffing, training and skills development, enterprise development and corporate social responsibility. And you will often hear a company being referred to as triple B double E compliant if they comply to the governmental policy. The final pillar that we are going to take a look at in today's lesson is the social pillar otherwise referred to as people. We'll look at both the positive effects and the negative effects of tourism on local communities, culture and heritage. We start with the positive effects of tourism on local communities, culture and heritage. And on the right hand side of your screen you have a number of positive social impacts that are listed. Tourism creates job opportunities for the local community. Those local community members can also sell arts and crafts which 
is a fantastic way of showcasing their culture. Tourism can benefit the local community with improved access to resources and infrastructure. Tourism creates an awareness of different traditions, cultures and art forms. Tourism creates intercultural understanding and tolerance. Local communities absorb new ideas, interests and values from tourists. Cultural her heritage is preserved and money can be raised for the maintenance of cultural sites and museums. The local community learn to take pride in their culture. The money generated can be used to uplift the community. So there is a list of positive social impacts of tourism. But unfortunately, on the other hand, there are also negative social impacts. And those include crime and violence, which could be on the increase. Cultural changes could occur as members of the local population could adopt the culture of tourists instead of valuing their own, own culture and heritage. It could happen that money generated by tourism um, is not channeled back into the local community and I was referring to that when we spoke about the economic pillar that is called economic leakage when money is not channeled back into the community. Another negative social impact is possible racial tension between locals and tourists. There could be negative tourist behavior. And also, unfortunately, at times, privacy is not respected. Sacred sites could be invaded and cultural ceremonies could be exploited. Then grade 12, as part of the social pillar, we will also take a look at the term CSI, which stands for Corporate Social Investment. Now, corporate social investment, as you can see on your screen, is the voluntary support businesses give to the communities that they operate in. Most companies have a CSI, Corporate Social Investment, policy. It is, however, voluntary for companies. They don't have to have it. But it refers to the support that that business gives back to the community that the business operates in. Now, that support can be financial in nature or it could be non-financial. Examples of financial support would be with regard to health care, funding of sport and recreation facilities, funding of education and youth empowerment programs. Whereas on the other hand, examples of non-financial support could be where you have a company representatives doing volunteer work in the community or a company giving a donation of equipment or furniture, or perhaps even running a feeding scheme for members of the local community. Okay, Grade 12, that brings us to the end of the sustainability lesson. As has become the uh, practice, I'm going to take a look at an activity that comes from an old exam paper. This particular one comes from November 2016. Let's read it together. Study the information below and answer the questions that follow. Sustainable tourist accommodation. This particular example is based on the Starlight Hotels Group. It reads as follows. The Starlight Hotels Group takes the sustainability of their hotels very seriously. The group ensures sustainable practices by reducing costs being more energy efficient and less wasteful. Tourists may also choose the no cleaning green option when they book accommodation at the hotel. Now that option means that the hotel room will not be cleaned or serviced 
for three consecutive days during the guest's stay. Now, you may think that is strange, but let's see why the hotel has a practice of this nature. Question 1. Identify one way in which the information above in which the starlight group practices each of the following pillars of the triple bottom line. So what the, the examiner is doing here is giving you the pillar and you are required to go back to the case study or the scenario and identify one way in which that particular hotel group practices the environmental pillar. There is your answer on the screen. They are more energy efficient. They are also less wasteful and offer a no cleaning option. Secondly, they supply you with the next pillar and then you have to refer to that. Actually, grade 12, there is a mistake there. That should be economic pillar. And how does the Starlight Group practice the economic pillar? By reducing running costs and lowering expenses. My apologies for that mistake. 8.1.2, the three R's, reduce, reuse and recycle, are sustainable practices implemented by the Starlight Hotels Group. Explain four ways in which the Starlight Hotels Group reduces its carbon footprint through the no cleaning green option. Now that was the one I referred to on the left hand side of your screen, the no cleaning green option and I said that's a bit strange if you're staying in a hotel but let's see why they do it. They do it because they want to reduce the amount of cleaning materials used. They want to reduce the water usage. They want to reduce energy usage and also want to make efficient use of human resources. And a question to you from the examiner, would you choose the no cleaning green option if you stayed at one of the, the hotels? So you are required to say yes or no, would you choose that option and motivate why you give that answer. So if you are in agreement, you would say yes. I am a responsible tourist and supporting their greening initiatives and want to play a part in protecting the planet. If you do not agree with the initiative, you could give a reason. For example, it is merely a way of saving the hotel money to the discomfort of the guest. I'd just like to just stop here for a second, grade 12. If you at question 8.1.3, just say yes or no, you will not be awarded any marks. The marks that you are awarded are awarded specifically for motivating your answer. Right, that brings us to the end of today's lesson, grade 12. I certainly hope you enjoyed it and wish you very well for your rest of your school year. Goodbye.